You are listening to Footy Talk. This is your place. You get all the news, interviews, and analysis from the world of AFL. And we are very lucky. Every Tuesday, we have one of the all-time greats of the AFL, Nick Rewell, joining us. Happy Easter to you, my good friend, Rui. I know you spent Easter on the ranch over there in Texas. How was it? It was great, Joey. It was great. Uh... Learned a, learnt a pretty valuable lesson about ranch life, and that is that it's not like the beach. Um, you've always got to have a pair of boots on because I uh, I went out to get a, a piece of wood, Joey, to just chuck it on the fire. Uh, it was dark outside, and um, yeah, being the sort of, you know, ranch type that I am, uh, you know, felt pretty confident in my surround. Oh, yeah, pull, roll your eyes. F- felt pretty pretty confident in my surrounds, and I walked out, and I was looking for the light switch, and I was walking along this wall, and I looked down because I'd, I'd trodden on something, couldn't quite figure out what it was until it started going. It was a bloody rattlesnake, Joey. What? I trod on a I trod oh. on a rattlesnake with bare oh. feet bare feet and somehow it didn't it didn't strike which is i'm told yeah. what a what a rattlesnake does and sort of slithered off and Did um, you freak out? called the called everyone out oh mate absolutely lost it actually <laughs> might have been a little bit of uh residue in my pants <laughs> i i don't think i've i don't think i've ever shit myself that hard in my life joey i was absolutely terrified Oh. terrified uh and co- so called everyone out everyone came out and had a look and yeah um you know they just sort of laughed at me like bare, barefoot like what are you doing oh idiot? man that is so, scary. a bit of a close call for me joey Gee whiz. so everything after that for easter was a uh was a bonus just a, just a bonus that's like my story remember the time when just i was just a bonus Al- remember the time when i, I was in, in albert hospital. park and i thought i saw the snake underneath all the leaves and it was the old uh the old the old sandal and i thought it was a snake and i called the snake <laughs> yeah. handler to come to albert park <laughs> And he goes, ah, oh, that's just a sandal. Uh, so that's my story. That's just a thong, mate. <laughs> there you was, go. Yeah, uh, full, full, good. full blown rattlesnake. Unbelievable yeah. scene. So, wow. Uh, but yeah, it was good, mate. Yeah. Hey, um, I worked all weekend. Really, plenty of footy happening, and I want to start as we always do. You've been over there for the week. What's your thought to come out of the last week or so? Well, I've been stewing on this one for a week, to be honest, and we covered some of it last week with the Peter Wright suspension and. Um, you know, whether that was whether that was just or not, but what absolutely shocked me afterwards was some of your commentary and your your mate what? in there who's a uh, who's a, a well. What do you mean? What you and Dale Thomas saying that we almost need to now a, a, a be accepting as an industry of players pulling out of contests? I could not believe it when I heard you guys say that. I was disgusted. And I hope that alarm bells were ringing in Laura Kane's office that two of the premier media commentators in the game were saying that as, a, as an industry, we should be accepting blokes being soft in, in the contest. Um, so I've been waiting to, to square up with you on that one for a week. And the other one was the, the whole drug issue that, that blew up last week that um, made news over here, believe it or not. It, 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 it has been a, a really big story. And, and here's my issue with it, and I know this is probably a little bit sort of outdated now that the issue was a week ago, but one thing that I, I don't think has been caught is, yeah, we've got, we've got a three-strike system that exists so players come forward and, and, and self-report and it helps and does all of those things. So that mechanism exists, and, and that's always been a bit of my contention with the system is that really you'd have to be an absolute moron to get done with the three-strikes policy because you're allowed to self-report. But that's all out of competition. The, the singular greatest deterrent to in-season drug testing has always been that there's a chance that you will test positive on game day, right? Yep, yep. There's a mechanism to circumvent that as well, mm. as it would appear. And the AFL had admitted it. And there, So there are no... The, the, the wash-up is there are no consequences for taking drugs in-season as a player because you can self-report. You won't get a lifetime ban or a two-year ban. The only consequence is that you might miss a game of footy. But if you're a pro, if you're a professional and you're taking drugs during the season, is that re- are you really going to like is that really going to hurt you not playing a game? Cuz I would argue that you're not a pro anyway cuz you're doing drugs during the season. Mm-hmm. And here's the other missing link is if you are then ruled out with a hamstring injury and you are getting match payments as a player, guess what? You still get paid. So have you, so fake, you're you can, saying if you do the fake hamstring injury. You do the fake hamstring industry, yeah. you still get paid as a player because you've got drugs in your system 
and that you took the week or, or two weeks prior. So I was, I was absolutely staggered when this whole thing came out. It needs a massive overhaul. And the fact that you can be resting under the guise of an industry uh, injury, still getting paid, having taken drugs in season, it, it, that to me reflects a broken system. And, um, and I hope the AFL change it, they act on it, and they, they go about it in a different way because um, I've been sitting on that one for a week and I, it just absolutely staggered me. That's a rant. Yeah, no, it's no. over. You, you can respond if you like, but um, I know it's been spoken about sitting on it for a week. No, that's fair. And you've been strong on this, and that has been your take, I think, for a number of years. You have been in that camp. So, no, that is a very good take. Hey, my thought of the week revolves around some of the stories that have been bubbling, not just this weekend, but in recent weeks, about off-field behaviour and off-field distractions and that in impacting team performance. So, I start off with the Brisbane Lions, and there's, we don't need to get too much into the, the story about what happened at their end-of-season trip and, and, and some issues domestically when they've come back home. That was back in November. And now media trying to put links to their form and saying that some, some stuff happens that affects their form. There's the same conversation around when a coach is out of contract. Oh, it's a distraction for the playing group. You've got to sign the coach because these distractions affect performance. Well, Ken Inkley and Port Adelaide showed last year when they let him ride out the year. They won 13 straight and finished top four. You even go to Melbourne, and there were people in the media that were over-exaggerating, oh, the crisis at Melbourne means that they're going to fall apart, and people had them out of their top eight and all these sorts of things. And there's even a smaller situation now at the Sydney Swans with Sam Wicks and, and another one involving, I think, an ex-partner of, of a teammate. I guarantee you the Sydney Swans' form over the next well, however long is not going to be affected because of that. My whole point is, Ru, I think those in the media that haven't been on the inside exaggerate the impact that, the, that these outside distractions have on actual performance. Because like what you touched on, if you're a professional player, if you're serious about your football and you're a serious football team, you worry about what you can control. And that is your training, your recovery, and what you do on game day. And I don't think all these other things actually affect your performance. Uh, I've never bought into it. Um, I think it's, it's over-exaggerated, and we've seen plenty of examples of it right now. And in fact, with the Melbourne one, I'd love some of these um, people that had opinions that, that Melbourne, their culture was horrible, and are now trying to say they've turned it around. Maybe look at themselves and say, maybe we exaggerated Melbourne's culture in the first place. Maybe because they do have a couple of players that were, that were misbehaving, we can guarantee you that there are these things going on at every single club. And I mentioned it a few weeks ago. There will be players misbehaving at every, or have mm. some you know, behavioural question marks about their, what they do outside the footy, uh, the footy club. At every club, there would be distractions and issues going on at every club. And the media might not hear about most of them. But to say that it affects performance for me, I think it gets completely overblown. Oh, I, I agree to a point, say with Melbourne, right, where it becomes a bit of an us against the world mentality. What about though, if, if what, and we don't know whether it's true or not, what about though, if there is internal bickering and internal distraction and internal unrest because of something that like has been allegedly reported, that surely that has an impact. If players are at odds with each other because they've lost relationships or, or whatever or whatever that is. Do you think that that's different to, say, the criticism coming from the outside attacking a group as a collective? Maybe slightly, if there's some... Into but we've, we've had players, Rue, that haven't liked other teammates for whatever reason, whether there has been issues. I mean, there was the famous one years ago, Tyson Edwards and Andrew McLeod apparently didn't talk to each other for about 15 mm. years in the locker room. And Adelaide had a successful... They won flags. Together, they won flags they? Yeah. and they were two of the all-time greats. Like, yeah. you don't have to get on with all of your teammates, but if you're a professional athlete and you go about your business properly and you put that to the side and get the job done, it shouldn't be an issue. I just think sometimes it, it, it can and... I'm sure there has been situations internally at other clubs where it has affected them and let them get to it. But if you're a professional team and professional players, yep. you should be able to put that to the side and get to work and get the job done. Winning, winning cures all, Joey. Well, that winning, winning cures all. Covered, Brisbane well, go out and win. Win. They they come out and win the next two, and it's a non-issue. So, and it, just on Brisbane quickly too. Like I, I think it's glass half full for them because you know they won the inside fifty count every week. They they're just not really converting their opportunities when they go forward. So, look, I think a bit of a rejig of that forward line for them. Maybe he would spend some time in the twos, build it around Joe. You know, they've got a, enough good ground-level players to be dangerous, and, and I think they can turn it pretty quick.
I agree with that. And I think the question though about Brisbane Rui is not that they'll turn around their form, because I believe they will too, and, and they'll play finals. It's a question of whether the 0-3 and three start affects them finishing top four or even top two for yep. them to win a premiership. Because they're not in it right now to finish fifth or sixth or seventh and make a prelim again. They're past that. They are in the Great spot point. to win the flag. Does the 0-3 yep. start and trying to play catch up? And there's been a whole re uh, history of teams that really struggle from 0-3 to make a grand final. Is that the bigger concern? Uh, yeah, because I th because dropping games at home, and that's the other you know, that, that's the home. concern for them that it's that it's harder for them to make it up when they've already dropped a couple at home. So, look, I, I think top four's a stretch from here. That the margin for error is is very very small. But um, you know, could they could they win it from fifth, sixth? I, I would probably suggest not because they haven't been able to do it with you know rolled gold top four opportunities the last few years. Spot on. Hey, one team that is actually going rolled gold and playing really good footy at the moment, the Fremantle Dockers. Probably the surprise packets yeah, of the season. Yeah, your boys. So far, three and zip, playing some really good footy. Uh, again, it's probably been one that you look back on now, and it was probably why I was more bullish on Fremantle than others, why I was really bullish on Geelong when others weren't, is you are you can have a dip year, and you've got to look at take the bigger picture into context. And Fremantle played finals, actually won a final the year before. So the whole adage just never as bad as it seems and never as good as it seems probably was was my thinking with Geelong and Fremantle in regards to their years last year. And the Dockers are playing some some really strong football. The cornerstone was always going to be their midfield and their defense. I know people wanted to see them play sexy footy on offense, and and I think that's actually affected the um the approach of some people in regards to another team that are struggling, the Adelaide Crows or Hawthorne, that people thought were going to spike off the back of their their offense and how good they look when they play well. But we know really the foundation of a strong team has to be your defense. And Fremantle have that. They weren't able to get it done last year, but they are back. And the other thing too that's slipping under the radar, they are missing like five or six of their best 22 from their team. We know about Sean Darcy, but Heath Chapman is a young player that they really rate. Brennan Cox is a star. Oscar McDonald came into the side to fill a void in defense. He's going to be out for a long period of time and a couple of other youngsters as well. So they have certainly been the surprise packet, but they get their biggest test this week against Carlton, who are flying at the moment. And so what's going wrong with, with the Crows then, really, really quickly? What, what, what's the issue for them? You think just the focus on offense and, and defensively, they, they haven't built that foundation like, like say, a Fremantle? Yeah, I think when I did my uh, pre-season analysis and you, and you dug a bit deeper into the Adelaide Crows, it was obvious that when you let them play their offensive game and they and they can play an open style of footy, they were, they were very hard to beat. So when they kicked 100 points last year, really, they were 8 and zip. So if they were able to score, they didn't lose. If you kept them under 100, they were 3 and 12. Well, all three games this year, teams mm. have kept them under 100. They're now 3 and 15. So teams have gone to work and say, we're going to make this. And that's why the games have been scrappy. Everyone spoke about the Fremantle Adelaide game as being a really ugly looking contest. Well, if you're the Fremantle Dockers, you go in and plan that game and say, we're not letting Adelaide. We're not going to let Rochelle and Rankin yep. and their skillful players get to work and Tech's going to have open space inside 50. So teams have gone to school on that and made it a bit of a scrap. And I don't think their midfield and their defensive system is strong enough at the moment. They're still quite inexperienced and they're still developing yep. to compete against better sides. So I think they've been found out in that regard. And it's up to Matty Nix and the coaching staff to find another angle and another way for Adelaide to win games rather than just relying on kicking a big score. Yep. No, couldn't agree more. And and the Fremantle Carlton game. I mean, to look, look at it at the start of the year. You wouldn't have anticipated that being uh, the, the sort of matchup that it's going to be this week. But that that shapes to be an absolute beauty. And I think uh, you know, great for both sides to have a really good litmus test against an inform competitor this early in the season. And you were big on Harry Mackay. He's flying. You could argue he's probably the informed player or one of the informed players of the competition. He's absolutely humming at the moment. Along with Charlie Kerno, they're going to pose a headache to any team in the competition. Hey, we will take a quick break because we want to get into real talk, shit talk after this. But if you are listening to Footy Talk, and if you do have a question for us, hit us up on Instagram at footy talk underscore pod or on TikTok at footy talk pod. If you're listening to Spotify, make sure you hit the bell and be notified when we drop a new episode, particularly on Tuesdays, the best show of the week. I'm here with Nick Rewalt. Let's get into real talk, shit talk. This is where we look at the statements that have been made by some people in the media over the last 48 hours, and we say whether it's real or whether there's a bit of mayo on that one. Rui, first one I'll to kick you. Us off. I'll kick us off. Oh, I'll kick us off, first. Joey. Okay. I, I want to go first. So I've got one for you, and I, the, like a bit of an issue has been made about Tom Hawkins being on the phone in the room's uh, Easter Monday game. 
Big issue, Joey. Real talk, shit talk. Oh, this is shit talk, Rui. I'm glad you brought this one up. I can't believe this is even a thing. There are uh, there are a number of officials that are allowed to have phones in the rooms for what for all different sorts of reasons. And during the rain break, when the official just shows Tom Hawkins something on the phone, and we believe it was the weather radar, which makes sense. I was going to say, it looked like the radar. That's right. There's absolutely no case to answer. Uh, I can't believe that's been made a big story, but that's what we do in footy. So that is shit talk. Mm -hmm. Good start by you. Hey, one back at you. David King on first crack, by the way. Good show on Sunday nights. He suggested <laughs> Zach Merritt is the best captain in the league right now. Real talk, shit talk. Uh, wow. Uh, no, shit talk. That's utter shit talk from Kim. Uh, <laughs> no, no. I, I, based on what? What was, what, like, based on what? Well, Bombers have been going, they've been struggling in recent years, and Zach Merritt has yeah. been the beacon. He has been the shining light with the way he's gone about his footy, the way that he's led, um, the way oh. he's trying to turn yeah. this club around. And it was a big yeah. win against St Kilda, and he was huge in yeah. the fourth quarter. Yeah. Um, no, give me Bontempelli. Thanks. Uh, for your story. <laughs> Uh, uh, yep. Uh, I've got another one. I've got yeah. another one for you, Joey. Uh, Nat five. If, if Lee, this is a big call from Lee Matthews. When we, Lee talks, we listen. If he can get back to his best, Lethal thinks Frio can win the flag. Well, it, there has to be shit talk in this because it's unfair to expect, expect Nat five at thirty two years of age to get back to his best. So it doesn't yeah. really, you sort of can't really marry the two up. That would be like me mm. saying you in 27. Well, you, and, hey, really, you, can you just wind back you, the clock for 10 years and we'll be right. Yeah. Like, if you, you can't do that. Pa Pavlich back at full four, they'd probably win it too. Yeah, um, so I, I yeah. don't think it's fair oh, to say saying. if Nat Five gets back to his best, it's great that he's fit and healthy and he's playing an important role as that inside mid that's allowing Sarong and Hayden Young and Andy Brayshaw to get to work. So it's a great complimentary mix, but it's unfair to expect Nat Five to get back to his best because he's a two-time Brownlow medal and I don't think he can get to that level, but he is playing great footy and Fremantle can still finish top four. Don't worry about that. Hey, another one back at you, uh, Richmond. There's been an article from Kane Corn suggesting that 2024 should be Dusty's last year and he should retire with a bit of juice left in the tank. I understand the sentiment, but I'm going to, I understand the sentiment because you, you want your champs to go out as you remember them. Um, but if I'm dusty, I'm milking it absolutely dry. 100%. I mean, what, what else? What else is he gonna? What else is he gonna do? He's always gonna command big bucks, and the real world is. Where's you know, he gonna go earn six hundred grand in the is, real world? Is, that, that's it. Well, at least Joey, at least. Um, so, so the real world is, you know, it's it's um, it's a bit tougher out there than the, the footy world. So I would suggest that Dusty stay in the game as long as he possibly can. Uh, and milk it dry. And we talk about, oh, what's his yes. motivation? Okay, he's not going to win a premiership, but let's be let's be realistic. This is a business. In America, we don't have a problem when players, for business reasons, yeah. go and make millions and millions of dollars. It is motivation for Dustin to play for another two years and pick himself up another million dollars plus. That is motivation. As much as Correct. we don't want to go there, uh, you're still allowed to do that as a professional athlete in what we do or what they do as a job. Give me yeah, one more. Absolutely. Uh, last one, jo la last one, Joey, and it's fresh off the back of the, the Geelong Hawthorne game yesterday. Uh, the umps, they are treating Jack Ginevan unfairly. Real talk, uh, shit talk. Uh, it's probably real talk. I think they are treating him probably unfairly, but he's not helping himself. He is still raising his arm, and we have been ever since, it's probably the Jack Ginevan rule, to be fair, it came in about 12 months ago, that if you are seen lifting your arm and you are contributing to the high contact, the umpires have been instructed not to pay the free kick. So he's not helping himself. If he just keeps his arm down, he would have received two or three free kicks yesterday, like everyone else did, for high contact. But he's contributing it to it, so I'd like to see him adjust his style first. And I guarantee you, if he does, mm. he will then get the free kicks and he won't be uh, umpired differently, as is the case at the moment. So you help yourself, Jack. The umpires will help you, and then everyone's a winner. Well, Sam Mitchell agreed with you. He, he basically he said as much that, you know, we encourage the players not to play for him. If you play for him, you basically forfeit all right. So he's, he's just found himself in a bad habit, but um, he's a good little player and he'll figure it out. Hey, great to see you again, Rui. Uh, always love chatting. We'll do it again next Tuesday. Of course, this is Footy Talk. If you do want to get involved, send us a message on Instagram at footytalk underscore pod. Tomorrow, it's the best looking couple, our best looking duo in the business, Abby Holmes and David Zaharakis. They will be in to take a look at the week from a player's point of view. Until then, enjoy your Tuesday.